really excited to have you here um, to talk a little bit, not just about the coffee, but your path to getting to where you have today, um, to talk to you guys and to see how Colby has been able to successfully live a life of work-life balance, doing things that he's passionate about, and really just like having an idea and going for it. So maybe we just start out talking about how you decided that you wanted to get into the business. Sure. Thank you guys for all coming. It's pretty pretty awesome to be here in a San Francisco at Google serving coffee to you all. Google was, um, I'll totally get to what you said. That's good. Yeah. Google was actually <laughs> one of our first, back in the day, clients actually that uh, we ever sold coffee to, a kind of a more, um, more big league client out of Santa Cruz, one of the first people we sold to, uh, was on the original Google campus. And uh, our 1950 blend, in fact, that we sell, one of our most popular selling blends, was named after the 1950 building at Google. So big ups. <laughs> but it's our trademark, so. Uh, just um, but so, yeah, I mean, I grew up not really, I guess, in the Bay Area, but in the, a couple hours north of San Francisco uh, in an area um, kind of Napa, Mendocino, Lake County, Sonoma County, families from Sonoma County. And I grew up uh, there farming pears and wine grapes. And with a, in the old kind of classic farming family and work hard and then play hard, but mostly work hard. And, um, you know, my dad went to UC Davis, did that whole thing. And so kind of was really instilled in early life about really caring about food and produce, where things come from, and also seeing really early on how, how there are a lot of people out there doing amazing work in food, and they're very rarely recognized or even less rewarded for that. And so that was kind of always on my mind in this back, back burner um, which we, I guess we can circle back to, but uh, it definitely instilled to me these kind of core values that that there's something to, there's something out there that exists for, for for doing great work in food, and that there was an opportunity there. But um, that more was a revelation I had later. But what kind of really kicked me into just getting into coffee is. The cliche reason most people get into coffee, which is you go to college, you go to coffee shops, you hang out, they're cool, you try to order cool drinks, you usually don't. <laughs> you know, my my gateway to coffee was drinking mochas that I hated. I loved everything about it except for this espresso taste. <laughs> when I was in high school, um, trying to go go play, I used to play jazz and uh, going to playing like jazz combos and going to coffee shops and just sort of being enamored with this coffee house vibe, this coffee house culture. Then you go to college, and then you end up studying there and hang out there, and you find the cool one, and you go to the one that's cool and not the other ones because it's not cool. And just kind of always in the back of my mind thought, cliche you know, coffee's cool, and wouldn't it be cool someday to, to do something in coffee? Didn't, more in the back, back of the mind, I went and did other things and studied environmental science, and I did GIS, and did that for like five years, and did a lot of computer stuff, and then wanted to really kind of do something on my own, which I guess maybe kind of coming back to that basis of growing up on a family farm. When you're in a family that farms, you don't like clock in for work. You just, it just is life. So I always just sort of thought I'd work for myself. And then after five years of not doing that, I, I kind of did, I was like a contractor, but uh, I really wanted to just start my own business. And so... And this was while you were in school, in college? This was right after I, I finished college, but I still lived in college, kind of in a college town um, up North Chico, and uh, where I ended up uh, living and going to school and other, other things. And... Um, we can get back to those other things. Yeah, that yeah, was cool. <laughs> Learned a lot about myself, and um, <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it was great though. Uh, it, was a, it, was, it was perfect, it was the path I was supposed to be on, and, but yeah, getting into wanting to start my own business, and 
ultimately taking that that leap. But when when I thought like, well, what do I? What is the business I want to do? I kind of came back to this thought that had always been incubating in the back of my mind that, well, coffee's cool, coffee shops are cool. I loved I loved music, and I just loved this. What I thought at that time was had a very direct tie to coffee houses. I collect vinyl, played in bands, only played analog instruments, and somehow coffee fit in the same strata as those those elements in my life. And so, without a ton, without any experience, but I went to talk to the guy in the cool town, in the cool coffee shop in town, to ask him, would you mind kind of, what does it take to do this? How do you, I be great? What does great look like? Which was an important lesson I've kind of tried to always carry with me moving forward. But, and he said, actually, I'm thinking about selling this coffee house. Are you interested in buying it? One thing led to another, and three months later, I was standing in the coffee shop that I owned with not exactly understanding what to do, understaffed, um, and really had to just feel the weight of it all, of what it's like to take that risk, that commitment, and just say, screw it, like, let's do this. So do you feel like it was, uh, that it was an out of comfort zone type thing, where you're like, I'm in a coffee shop, and somebody's presenting this to me, and I hadn't planned on it, but now here this opportunity is. Was it an easy decision for you to just say, yep, I'm going to do it? Or you know, how did you feel going into that? I don't know if it was an easy decision, but I kind of have a point of view on, certain, on these things, which is that decisions are hard, so sometimes it's best just to corner yourself. You know, burn your bridge, whatever you want to say. But I, you know, make the commitment before. You're, I, I'm all about an analysis. I was an analyst, an, an analyst for five years, so I'm all about analysis and research is my favorite thing to do in life. Probably one of them. But at some point, you just jump, and you won't ever have all the information. And I do believe uh, a saying that once kind of came to me. Um, my sister, who's up here, was can bear witness. In the classic place where you gather all life information to make important decisions, which is after a Prince concert at a blackjack table at like 2 in the morning. Um, but I ended up talking to someone who worked in technology and I guess had built a pretty successful company. And we, were, we ended up talking for a long time. And I just said, if you could give some piece of advice to a young person who's wanting to really do something special and really get to maybe in a position like you're and not necessarily like I don't know if he was wealthy. I'm pretty sure he might have been, but just more, I could just tell that he had gotten to some place that he felt very satisfied with. And he just, without even blinking, just looked right at me and said, take chances and overextend yourself. And that's sort of been my go-to since that night. And in a way, it's this permission that some dude at a blackjack table after a Prince concerts gave me. So of course it's valid and totally trustworthy. I feel like um, those little things come into your life at just different times that reinforce that you are on the right path and doing the right thing. I mean, here you are now, co-founder of a global company, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's awesome. Yeah, and I think too. It. Uh, I mean, to answer your question, it. The decision was it wasn't easy, but just n feeling like I had this permission to make it, and then just jumping, choosing to jump instead of choosing to, let's just wait a little bit more. I'm more of a jumper, for better or worse. But I think um, there is something to that that you know, in life, you have to make a lot of choices. And so I think getting comfortable with making choices or becoming decisive, knowing that you're, knowing you're for sure not going to be right. Um, was it the best decision I could have made in my life? I'll never know, but it was the one I made and it got me here. It was a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely a critical decision, um, which then led me to my next decision, which was to start Verve with uh, my business partner, Ryan, who's over here. Hi, Ryan. <laughs> he doesn't like being outed, but. So you had your store in Chico, mm -hmm. or your shop in Chico. And what, what was the path then to opening up your own, your own brand? Well, one year into it, after 
being super understaffed and you learn a lot when you don't have anyone you can when you know that there's no one else's responsibility but yours, there's no like that, there's no boss. You just you look for it and you realize, shit, I'm it. Mm -hmm. And you just okay, now what do I? What am I gonna do? And you you have to make calls. Um, a lot of bad decisions, a lot of great decisions, but decisions nonetheless that move you forward. And um, learning a lot about having the right people on the bus and learning what it's like to have wrong people on the bus and have to fire people and do all these things was my first kind of year in business. But what came through it besides the business parts and you know, sales tax and all these bookkeeping things that are not my big passion, but are super important <laughs> if you want to run a business. Do not think they're not important. Uh, hire an accountant before you hire anybody else. Um, and uh, was how much I was falling in love with coffee. Because when I got into coffee, it wasn't for coffee, it was for coffee house culture. But after one year into it, spending every day doing it, becoming a barista, just and connecting with a couple of people, my friend Sean White, who now does Flat White, he's a ceramicist for a lot of coffee shops around. Uh, he was our first employee at Verve. Um, uh, a few other people, and dropping into the world that became like barista culture, third wave coffee. I, I was, I became completely enamored with coffee itself, and as an analyst and a researcher. This like trap door opened, and I like fell through it, and it was just the universe of just where does coffee come from? Why are some coffees taste different than others? What's happening? What's up with roasting? What are different origins? What's up with different varieties? I have to know everything about all of this, and I was thinking about how do I learn? How do I jump in? Because I just had this coffee shop, and I thought about my friend from college who I played music with who had been in coffee his whole life and was a home roaster and was the biggest coffee geek I knew. And Ryan O'Donovan, my business partner, and we started, I called him one day just from a park bench in front of a farmer's market and said, dude, we should start a coffee roasting company together. He had just moved back from Portland, uh, working at coffee shops, coffee shops, coffee roasters, wholesale, everything. And long story short, we just met up a few days later, started looking for spots, and within a couple months, we signed a lease. Um, and started Verve. In Santa Cruz. Yes, in Santa Cruz. We almost, we were originally gonna open in San Francisco. And at this time, two, 2005, we opened, the only third wave coffee company in all of California was Ritual on Valencia. In all of California, and they carried Stumptown. And that was it for the whole state. So at this point in time, if you opened a cool company anywhere, people everywhere knew about it. Uh, we were gonna open in San Francisco, then almost open in like Berkeley, Berkeley, Oakland. At the last minute, right before we were supposed to sign the lease, I got a call from Ryan. He just said, dude, I'm moving to Santa Cruz because I got my lady. We're probably going to get married someday, which he did. And they have two awesome kids. Uh, and said, this is the lifestyle I want to have. I want to be able to surf. I want to be able to ride mountain bikes. I want to build a company where I want to be. And so. It kind of fell apart for like a week or so, and then I kind of thought, well, let's just go look at Santa Cruz. And one thing led to another, and we ended up making the commitment there, and said, well, let's see if we can make noise, even though we're here, which we didn't think we'd be able to, to do, but you know, fortunately, we were able to, to do that. That's awesome. Um, so basically, it goes to the idea of work-life balance and choosing a location that can adapt to the things that you want to do in life, where you can pursue this, this passion that you have, a dream that you have, that you want to achieve, but also yeah. to be able to maintain, like, I want to go surfing, I want to go mountain biking, or mm -hmm. whatnot. So can you talk a little bit more about that and how you're able to achieve that? Um, it's a great, to, it's to a great, run, it's a great write, question. Right. <laughs> it was definitely in the ethos of, of starting our company, like as I described, but I think Fast forwarding to present day, or just it's hard, you know. I mean, it requires you saying that you want to do that, and then, I, I mean, work-life balance. You know, I've heard like you know work-life harmony. You know, um, Bezos talks about that, and I think it's interesting to think about it because it 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 really determine it's really dependent on the individual where they are at in their life, their age, 
what they want what's, and what's energizing them to determine, is that a light switch? Is it a yin and yang and they have to be opposites and that's how they are distinct but also fuel each other? Or, how you, or is it a fader? Or is it, like I think of the harmony as like multiple things at once but it's like C major or maybe it's like D minor depending on, depending on your mood. <laughs> I love D minor. Um, and, uh, but it takes, I think it takes practice. And again, it just, it's different for different people. I mean, for sure, it, you know, one thing for sure as an exercise is just, again, I'm like, I like cornering myself. So, is to force yourself into doing something where you for sure can only be thinking about that one thing. So whether that's a lot of people have sports, you know, like surfing or mountain biking, get into your like flow state, which I know can happen on computers in a lot of different ways I've experienced. But if you take it into like outside of work and you can pick up an activity or an exercise or something or yoga, float tanks, I don't know, whatever it is for people, I like all that, but uh, that you, just have to be in that moment because it requires all of your attention and that's like one way to break. Whether it's you take always have two days off in a row or every year you take off for a few weeks to go do something or, you know, so there's a lot of different ways to, to do that but I like trying to figure out, find activities that require all your attention. That uh, definitely makes sense. I think that just in general the culture here um, is, or not here as in Google, but here as in the US is that it's very work focused and to be on the clock all the time and mm -hmm. to make sure you're doing everything all the time. But um, there's something to be said about breaking that up and doing the things that you love, making work even something that you love and making sure you're in that mm -hmm. right headspace. And um, I admire the fact that you're able to go to two, so many different activities and focus on them and the drive that you have is really amazing. So i um, just gonna call that out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I think you were saying about enjoying what you do. To me, that's a big part of it. I mean, that's why I started my own company. But I just, I, I used to do all of our orientations for like six years, every single employee that ever worked at Verve. I did every employee's orientation. I used to just tell people like, we want people that want to be here. And if like, you don't want to be here, I want you to, to quit. Which is hard. And, right? and not meaning like, because we're so cool and like, you don't belong, but no, just like, I'd, I will help you find, you know, put in notice, whatever, I'll help you find a different job, but you owe it to yourself to do something you're passionate about, uh, whether it's starting your own business or, or not, because people are different, energized in different ways, mm -hmm. or being part of a, a, a team that has a huge lever for change, like Google, um, or how you get empowered in your own way. Um, but I don't, I do, th the one thing that kind of, the work-life balance, when I feel like it's this dichotomy, that I don't like is the feeling that you would just do something that you, that it could mean you put up with something that you don't love to do or even like to do, but you only have to do it eight hours a day and then you get to live your life, which is cool. I mean, there's like a lot of the best musicians I've known in the world had day jobs that were whatever, but I do, I, I, I do think it is important to just find what you're passionate about or find how to be passionate in what you do because it just makes, everything better and to me a little bit that's like the harmony part which is that you, you know that your work should be part of what fulfills you and I think that that shows in your shops as well um, the, I've been to a few of them and the staff is very um, friendly they all do their job really well and they seem to actually enjoy being there so maybe you could talk about how you incorporate that into your into your company culture yeah. Aside from telling them that they can quit if they don't really want to be yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> I want to tell people they have to quit if they don't want to be here. But um, because I think that's what people should do, but uh, for themselves. But it is something that's probably been the most difficult thing as we've scaled. Um, because as you, when you have one shop or the small team, right? I forget the number of people talk about is like a, for a small tribe. 10, 15, 30 people. But once you blow, once you exceed that, there's a lot that happens innately 
especially when you have the small group leaders are present, this trickle down effect, it just, it's just very obvious to everyone what that, it's easier to set expectations without having things so explicitly written. But as you scale, you know, 40, 50, 80, 100, 200 employees we have at Verve now. I don't know how many employees Google has, but I'm sure it's more than 200. <laughs> it's probably about 200 in this room. And, uh, but it's the hardest thing to do is to scale culture because at a certain point, you have to like literally be thinking, how am I engineering culture now? And it feels there's a, a falseness, if that's a word, that comes with that idea that you're engineering culture. But I kind of became enamored with it a little bit because what well, you're just trying to, it's, it's a point of being self -reflect, about being reflective and self-aware as a brand and as a company about, and to figure out how you want to communicate that and to build that into the culture, to set those expectations and then ultimately have you know, the right people on the bus. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of, I know maybe it's like old school now, but like, you know, good to great. Uh, Jim Collins, getting the right people on the bus, there's no substitute for that. You cannot, you cannot train somebody into getting it. Like you have to just get the right people and then figure out how to empower them and that's what, we're, that's what we've done at Verve, and that's what I think we're really focused on this, this next year and beyond, is to really figure out how to build a framework so that people really feel empowered and can sort of channel their own entrepreneurial spirit in what they do. And, and that, that's a little bit of, I think, what, what you experience when you come into Verve and you have people smile and greet at you. We've been criticized for being too friendly. <laughs> Whoops. You know, because some people think it's fake, but I don't ever want that. I don't want there to ever be a fake vibe at Verve. It's, it's not that. We don't tell people, like, and then make sure you put on your smile and get your flare badges. And, like, <laughs> it's not about that. It's like we tell people just be normal. Like, just be real. If you're not someone who would say, smile or say, hey, how's it going to someone who, like, walks in and stands in front of you, then, like, okay, that's, like, that's your world, but maybe this isn't, you know, Verve's not the right culture for you. So we're just, we just try to find friendly, outgoing people that want to, like, take care of you and tell them to just be normal. <laughs> um, so I guess leading into that, we can go on the flip side of that to your relationship with your, your vendors, the people mm -hmm. who provide um, the coffee grounds. You want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. The grounds or? The grounds. I'm sorry, the beans. <laughs> I'm just kidding. People see our roaster sometimes in uh, uh, in um, Seabright in Santa Cruz where we have our roastery. It's all, we've always created this like whole fishbowl effect with our roastery. We, it's very transparent where, what we do and you can come see it. And they always see these big round drums, cylinders rather, and they say, oh, is that, is that where you grind the beans? It's like <laughs> these giant grinders, but there are coffee roasters, but anyway, I'm just kidding. Just That's good, Christy. call me out. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah, for sure, I mean, we call it, uh, like our sourcing program at Verve, farm level we call it, uh, is, does go full circle for me personally back to growing up on a farm and with a parent who was with parents, but my, you know, my dad was going to, my mom growing up on a farm herself and then my dad also growing up on a farm and going to UC Davis. It was really instilled and, and being like really take care of business people that never did shortcuts and just kept, you know, the orchards and vineyards meticulous all year round, never had garbage on the ground. Everything's just perfect, and the fruit, you would, uh, would show that. You know, my, they, they grew some of the best uh, Sauvignon Blanc and pears anywhere in, in the world. And, but they never really got paid premiums for it. They were just treated as a commodity, and it's like kids on laptops psh, psh, buying, what's this, how much is the price, how much is it over here? four cents cheaper per pound over here, buy it here, send it to the grocer, with no sense of like, but what's the difference in quality? Who are these people? What's their background? Is there any value add we can, you know, like just, it's just, just a commodity. And coffee uh, being one of the more traded commodities in the world, I mean, for perspective of how much coffee's out there, Starbucks buys like 2.2.5% of the world's coffee. So there's the other 97.5% of the world's coffee that's not being sold by Starbucks. That's how big the market is. It's a commodity market. And so when we got into Verve and wanting to figure out how we could do something different, 
and the tipping point of what became kind of third wave coffee was to go find the best coffees in the world and that there was this this new new world happening of discovery and and just extraordinary flavors coming into the world of coffee and we sought to go find them so when we started Verve for the first I'm not sure four, six seven years or so I was I was our only coffee buyer so I traveled like four months out of the year all around the globe Central America South Af uh, South America East Africa for like four months out of the year traveling to go find coffees meet producers go back and see those producers again discover new gems out position people on coffees and to really help find them but also to help be part of what is maybe the point of the spear of a enormous global industry, but to just help say we're willing to pay you equitably for this work you do, which produces an extraordinarily high quality product. That same product that we're then going to take and sell at a higher premium than we maybe some people sell, definitely compared to what most people sell, uh, because there's a value that it's worth it. And we think that, I guess I'm off the rails here, but I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just fully steered away from how <laughs> being nice to producers, but, um, which we are. But no, I mean, but to me, econ the economic lever is like the most important lever. If you want to help a farmer, pay them more. You could go ask every single one of our farmers and say, what do you really need? And they're just going to say, just pay me more. They're like, a lot of people think like farmers, it's like a pity thing and all this. And I don't, I hate that marketing. I hate that kind of cause marketing for coffee, for producers, because growing up on a farm, like my grandpa, so badass. My dad, hard as nails. Like those are not, those are the last people on earth that want your pity are like farmers. They just want to be treated fairly and to feel like their hard work is like worth it. They have enough stress with like mother nature and a lot of other things than to. So we, we sort of built our business around that. And, you know, and it really starts with customers paying more for a cup of coffee because there's X amount of dollars in a cup of coffee. And then everyone has their margins. And I believe in supply chain. I mean, you need, you know, someone's drinking the coffee, going back in time. Someone's delivering the coffee, roasting the coffee buying the coffee, importing the coffee, someone exported the coffee, someone shipped it and insured it in between, someone milled the coffee for export right before that, somebody processed the freshly picked cherries, and then someone grew those cherries. You need all of those steps. I mean, people can be vertically integrated or whatever, but those steps don't go away. And everyone, I think it's cool if everyone has a sustainable, biz, transparent business model. Uh, like the middleman concept is that, and it, Middlemen to me are more like is a term tied to people that operate within a supply chain that take advantage of it without transparency and exploit people on either side of them. But as far as steps in a supply chain, everybody's critical. And we all through those points of the supply chain, we treat all of them with as much respect and honesty and transparency as we can. Because at one end of that supply, at the other end of the supply chain is the producer. And at, the, and at the other end, the bookmarks are literally coffee drinkers and coffee growers. And they're the most disconnected physically and emotionally. You know, like people that are like growing coffee on the hills in Santa Barbara, Honduras, totally can't necessarily relate to people that work at Google, but, or maybe vice versa, but those are like the two most important parts. Everyone else is facilitating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could say we're curators. We go find this stuff. This is cool. This is hot. This is not. But you need someone to throw down money at the one end, and you need someone to be willing to produce at the other end, and those two need to kind of have a synergy between the two. So we work really hard in our, our whole business to create that bridge and sort of foster that economy. So yeah, I was really curious about that decision to be in Santa Cruz and not one of the obvious places that you were probably uh, thinking about being. Um, a lot of us here in marketing are touch marketing, and I would think you know you have to go where the business is or where the people would be. Um, 
how was marketing for you and getting your name out and getting going when maybe you were thinking about just, you know, surfer, surfers walking in for coffee? It's not necessarily someone that's going to, I don't know, like a business person in the yeah. valley. Yes, being where the people are could have, I mean, if we had opened in San Francisco 10 years ago, maybe we'd be even in a different type of company uh, as far as timing and everything. But for me, although we were based in Santa Cruz for like our, for like, some personal reasons, Ryan and I, our goal was never to be the best coffee in Santa Cruz. Our goal was to be the best coffee in the world and to create the best coffee company in the world. We just didn't know if anyone was ever gonna even get it or care, but we were, that was our path, was like, I want our coffee to be, you know, our influences were my, you know, my friends out of Oslo and Norway and, you know, just like what's happening in Australia and Melbourne. It, like, we were really wanting to step up to that stage, and I think it's because of that uh, and, and the timing of when we, when we opened uh, as early super early adopters, uh, that's kind of how it, all, how it all came together. And then once we had those little opportunities, we had product that stepped up to it. I mean, one of our first places our brand ever went from Santa Cruz like two months in was straight to the heart of Manhattan with uh, Cafe Grumpy out there who at the time was the East Coast caught ritual. Uh, there's a lot more on the East Coast now, but they were very early. And someone came through Santa Cruz and had our coffee, thought it was amazing, brought a bag of our Ethiopia conga and brought it back to them. And I remember I was working bar and I had to duck down by the counter. I got a call from the manager at Cafe Grumpy that said, we want to feature you on bar here in Manhattan. And then that's how Oliver Strand from the New York Times heard about us. And then he wrote about it. It just, so it was based on quality. But, um, and I think the idea that we, we're trying to think big, but even just because that's what we wanted out of the company personally. Um, and then that ended up working. So I guess kind of like secreting it a little bit. And, 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 and as the, brand, the brand's super important, like straight up, like design, brand, that always matters to us, how we want to design our stores, customer experience, how we want to look, be, what we think of the brand, we've always really been into brand and design as well, so we always thought of that. So it's kind of a two-part question, but you mentioned that when you were uh, initially picking your first location, uh, Third Wave Coffee hadn't really taken off yet, right? Um, and obviously in the last 10 years, uh, there's been an explosion of that, especially in the Bay Area from yeah. Equator, Four Barrel, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first question is, uh, amongst the other Third Wave players, are there any that you really admire and why? Um, and the second piece of that is, how do you see uh, how do you see Verve in relation to some of the other players in this space? What, from from your perspective, really sets Verve apart from from the pack? Sure. Yeah, I mean, well, it's kind of split into two groups really because a lot of the people that were our biggest, a couple of people that were our big influences on us when we were opening, Stumptown, Intelligentsia. Um, Ryan, my business partner's brother, worked at the Blue Bottle Kiosk on Linden Street when that was all they had. So we go back in that world. Those were all influences on us. And as you know, there's been a lot of business activity with a lot of brands, including those three brands. So now that they're kind of off the table in that regard, being, uh, you know, with the M&A stuff that's happened, looking to the other side of things, what other brands are out there that now influence us or that I think are you know influential. I mean, there's, there's. I mean, I see stuff all the time on Instagram. New people, brands following us or something. I'm like, who's this? I check it. out, I'm like, damn, that's a killer logo. That brand package. That packaging is cool. I like how they did this. I see like cold beverage drinks being made and serving where, and I'm like, that's hot. You know, I just see, it's kind of things happening all the time here and there, and you know, um, but like the the major brands that had you know that had a lot of influence on us early, just because. You look up to see like, well, who's doing it and who else is doing it, and those were the ones we looked up to. So now, we're kind of like on our own trajectory. And how we feel different? I mean, we, I feel like we've always had service first, uh, especially like ten years ago, and that was super not cool in the cliches of like, you know you know, waxed apron, you know, waxed mustaches and like, you know, suspenders and all this stuff. Um, 
and Rockstar Baristas, we were like super anti that. In fact, that's actually one of the main reasons we never opened in San Francisco, uh, is that we just didn't, there was like the, an energy that was happening, a very young, young, tense energy, and we were just not, we didn't want to really get pulled into that world. We wanted to just kind of go do our own thing. And so I, I guess maybe that's another way. We've always just done our own thing and worried about what we're up to. I, I totally influenced and love seeing what everyone's doing. I'm super into like all, everything that happens. But at the end of the day, Verve, we just go to our own, we kind of just go our own path and be really nice to people, really focus on our retail environments being more residential than commercial, have a whole, have wholesale program that can step up and really service like this level of business, but still be like down to earth. Our, you know, we're putting a lot of energy into our online stuff right now. And then we have some RTD and some other, some cool single stir stuff that we're working on for like new innovative, like next step stuff with our company. I drink coffee uh, occasionally. Um, don't really think about what's in my cup too much. Um, maybe everybody here knows what it is, but I don't really know much about like third wave coffee and like what that movement means and like, yeah. was there a first wave, a second wave? Is there like a fourth one? Like, <laughs> it went like we gotta... ninth, sixth, and then third. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I was just kind of wondering, maybe you could provide some more context on that, and also maybe yeah. talk about where you got your name from. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, those are great questions, because, uh, yeah, I mean, the idea of first wave, second wave, third wave, um, loosely is like first wave is like our grandparents' coffee, institutional canned coffee, Folgers Uban, Maxwell House, sort of that post-war era coffee, which was really where coffee got big in the US and really started the real commercialization and commoditization of coffee. Second wave, so that ran for like 30 years or so. Then second wave comes about with basically is the Starbucks revolution, Howard Schultz, creating, going from just like coffee is this thing that you take two scoops, put in here, mix with water, and you have coffee, or it's like 25 cent diner coffee, nickel diner coffee, into now you step into espresso culture espresso drinks, basically espresso culture for starters that that came, that Howard brought from Europe um, after visiting there. And the idea of like $4 coffee, you know, that kind of concept of espresso culture, $4 coffee, and coffee houses as like, he's coined the term third place. You know, if you work home in this other place, whether it's coffee shop or, or not, but just this idea that coffee isn't just the thing your grandpa drinks in the morning before going out and like bailing hay. <laughs> it's like cool. I'm gonna, like my mom does it and like meets her friends there. So that is second wave, and then third wave came as like just this next generation said. Grew up. Everyone grows up on the previous generation. Grew up on Starbucks. Not me personally, but just because uh, I grew up in a super small town, didn't have a Starbucks, still doesn't. Um, but uh, that what's next, and 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 that there was people started finding these little. Lots of coffee that taste a difference. The auction systems that, that in, in the coffee world, in the niche insider world, started for like the best of Panama auctions, these cup of excellence auctions where they started rewarding farmers based on cup quality blind and having auctions for their coffee. Um, there was a book written called God in a Cup uh, that really um, was a turning point to put third wave on the map of, and this, and the gate, you know, and, um, the geisha variety of coffee that has been sort of synonymous with the highest quality, although, you know, th that that symbol is 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 definitely it's getting planted in a lot of places that maybe that coffee shouldn't grow, but where it still grows the best, a lot of places where we get that coffee, it's still one of the best coffees in the world. So those are kind of like those three three phases. So yeah, yeah, Grandpa's coffee, Starbucks Revolution, and then for lack of a better term, the hipster coffee world that we all think of as coffee. Now. Those are like the, although I'm sure like in 1975, if you were like 20 and you got coffee, you thought you were, you were, you were a hipster getting coffee at the hipster coffee shop. It just, so those are those three eras. And then um, everyone, a lot of people ask what's fourth wave. You know, I'm not, people are ready to jump to fourth wave right now. And I've heard like fourth wave is cold brew, fourth wave is this, fourth wave is convenience, fourth wave is bringing food into your cafes. Like we've brought like a lot of a more Melbourne sense, sort of concepts into our store, avocado toast, things like that. Um, I don't know, I think to me that's still an extrapolation of third wave, fourth wave probably shouldn't really come for like another 10 or 15 years per the 
unless we're kind of on a geometric sort of growth plan here. But um, yeah, so, and then around our name, Verve, it's, it originally came because it's, it's a record label, Verve Records, Verve ja it's a jazz label. And we were just trying to think of names. We had a million names and Ryan, because we both play music and jazz, uh, said, what about Verve? And it kind of just stuck and we looked it up and it was available and kind of sat with it for a while and we ended up calling ourselves that. So, but it means the spirit and enthusiasm surrounding the creation of art. And so once we saw the definition, I was like, damn. <laughs> that really feels right. Like, it's like passion, energy. Like if you have a lot of verve, you, maybe that's the energy you feel when you come into a verve cafe, people behind the bar. It's like trying to just be posy. Uh, I was going to also ask you how you got your name. Um, so that was an easy one. So I'm going to totally pivot and ask Check. you a, a tough one. Oh. Um, Thanks for coming, by the way. Um, just thinking about like coffee has this like very specific kind of climate that it grows in, and you mm -hmm. see it, you know, in equatorial regions. And sure. I think anecdotally, it seems like a lot of those regions are also areas of high conflict. You, know, you look at Central America yeah. or Yemen, um, parts of Africa. Like, what's our role in all of that? And you know, we're so so separated from the growers. Um, just because of the nature of how coffee grows and where we are physically. Um, do you have a role in that, like for good or for bad? Like, do you have a point of view on like how our collective hunger for coffee is hopefully making lives better? And Yeah, that's a good question. I don't work for the CIA. <laughs> uh, and I just watched, I'm totally up to speed on Narcos, so. Um, so yeah, I can answer this question. Um, it's, you're, I mean, you're right. It's, it's, I mean, like all Latin America, I mentioned Narcos because that's, I mean, you hear about this. When you travel to all these countries, you hear about the history of a lot of things that back in the day felt like conspiratorial. And then you're like, oh yeah, but then everyone, you just hear it firsthand. Um, you know, I won't go, that's like another talk probably, but uh um, with just U.S. involvement. Obviously, I'm not a Latin American studies, but I'm sure there's people who could school me all up on that. But it's, you know, th it's, it's, it's tough. Um, I mean, there are certain places that we don't buy coffee from because it's so complicated. But I, one, to travel there. Uh, like, I can't go to Yemen right now. But um, uh, I mean, I've been to Rwanda and Burundi, and I've been in Kenya, like, in, part, in, in, in parts of Ethiopia um, and all places in Colombia, it gets can get really real down there in southern Colombia. But um, and there's certain places I can in Colombia I can't go and be there overnight, or I can't it, you can't even really go during the daytime. But we go to a lot of out there places in Colombia. But to answer your question, I see coffee as a lever for change, and I see that lever really saying the word quality on it. And that's the lever, the coffee lever that we moved. And to me, I just really believe that, not like what we do is so important, like Verve, like we're, I mean, we're just a small sliver, but all we can do is what we can do, and we want to do it clearly and loudly. And that is to just say that we, that, that's part of the reason we travel to go meet producers, is to understand who they are and to understand wh how, what, it, how our approach can help them Again, not out of charity. Farmers don't want your charity. They just want to be treated fairly. But uh, we go, f so I, I, I think one of the best things you can do is just help, help create, you know, for any farming families, help create a stable economy and something that they can count on. And, some, and, if, they're, and if, the, if you find producers that have a good address, their farm's in a good spot, and they're willing to put in this extra work because they're passionate about it. You see it all the time. The best farmers are the most passionate ones. There's ones that get lucky, but not really. You, need, you do need to have a good site, this side of the hill, this elevation, this type of microclimate, this aspect, the soil, all this. But really, it comes down to the farmer's passion and hard work. And I do feel like what we do in that way is good because it opens up opportunities for people to make more, have more opportunities and more decision-making authority and 
and how they, how they live. But it's super complex. I mean, East Africa, Yemen, come on. I mean, like Kenya even, and then all of Latin America's Mostly, it's, it's really simmered down a lot, but then with all the, all, everything happening with the cartel and stuff like that, it's, you know, it's its own thing. But we try to steer clear of it and just sort of do what we can to empower farmers. I wonder um, about this notion of paying for quality and a lot of the talk about, like, the progression of uh, coffee and how it's viewed. Um, is there anything else or like any other industries or within the food space even where you see an opportunity for that transition to happen where people have expectations of, you know, paying very little for something where you can see kind of bringing like you know, either higher quality options or um, higher quality brands with also that higher price tag? It's, I mean, it's probably in everything to be honest with you. I mean, part of it is what industries globally are available for that, and part of it is how we nationally think about food. So I can't remember the statistic offhand, but I've, I've said it before, but um, like the percentage Americans spend on food is like really low in the developing world. It's like, don't hold me to this, but it's something like a quarter, like a lot of people in like France or Italy spend on food. So part of it is just a desensitization a desensitizing, a desensity. What am I trying to say here? You know what I'm saying. We are desensitized on the price of food because of a lot of reasons, including like subsidies and corn and things like that. And we see that as the value add is cheaper, is better, and bigger is better. Not this room necessarily, but that's just this thing that's been kind of drilled because for for good reasons. Because that's like how people think about um, food security is one of the best ways to like, you know, grow a nation, but. So I think you could look at almost anything and think, well, what, what, what is the version of this that helps create change? And what, who is in the supply chain that wants to do better and who already wants to produce something better? And how do we help them have a voice? I mean, you could just, I mean, like parallel programs, T. T does really, I mean, tea, tea has done really amazing. I mean, really, really amazing tea growers in China and Japan can get paid really great prices for their tea. I mean, you could pick any commodity and dissect it and try to find out how we could leverage the people that want to do quality. Because I, I be, on one end, I believe it's us helping producers. But I also think there's just a huge audience that just wants better stuff. Like, there's a huge audience of people that just like, I pay 50, 50 cents more for blackberries if they always tasted amazing or like strawberries or, I mean, you could just pick anything you eat, any fruit and say, would you be willing to pay 50 cents more? Because that could be like a 20, 30% increase in the price. It can be applied almost anywhere. Um, we choose just to be focused in coffee, but I do think about that a lot from in, that there's an audience that wants, there's an audience that wants quality and they want to have this better experience in their life and they're willing to pay for it. And there's pe people that want to produce that and it's just connecting those two ends of the supply chain, because without them, without people producing high quality anything, there's no, no product for people to buy. And without people willing to step up and pay premiums for quality experiences, then there's no livelihood for or reason for people to do it. So, and I believe fundamentally both of these two ends of the spectrum exist in almost everything we touch. It's just a matter of connecting them. So and that's what we try to do in coffee. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming. Cool. Thank you all for coming. Thanks. Thank you.